Why don't you take your Bibles out and turn to Second Peter chapter three? It's in the back of the Bible. Second Peter chapter three, verses fourteen through eighteen. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you will not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And the key part that we're going to look at today is 16. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. As they do the other scriptures. So that verse 16, that is one of the clearest statements that the whole Bible fits together. It's other parts of the Bible that, that we could talk about that imply the same things or say the same things, but this is one place where it says it really clear. One of the bullseye passages. As they do the other scriptures. Most of the New Testament was written by Paul, or at least most of the books in the New Testament were written by Paul. And so here is Peter saying, you know, these letters of Paul... They're pretty much the same as the other scriptures. People twist them around. Oh man, it's doing that again. Doggone it. All right. In your outlines, it says, as they do the other scriptures, one of the clearest statements that the whole Bible fits together. There we go. One of the clearest statements that the whole Bible fits together. Now, some like to read the Bible as separate pieces. There are people who like to just read the Bible and they like to just take certain parts of it and go with those and kind of forget about the rest. And that's easy to do. In seminary, we kind of talk about how we all have certain parts of the Bible that we kind of gravitate to. And, and that's, I mean, that's sort of just human nature, but, but really we need to think of the Bible as, as a whole that fits all together. You can't pull out one string and then expect everything else to just stay put. If you pull out parts of it, it like Jenga, it's going to just fall apart. Now some people lead, read the Bible as a, a list of verses, There are some people who separate the Old and New Testaments. In fact, one of the first heretics out there was a guy who said, you know what, let's forget about the Old Testament. In fact, let's forget about the Old Testament. Let's just go with Luke and Paul's letters, and that's it. That was one of the first first people to really throw, throw things off. And sometimes we'll say things like, well, the New Testament, that just invalidates the old or it trumps the Old Testament or something like that. And there's one verse that that people will sometimes use to to try to say, well, we we have to read the Bible in in separate parts. And it's only worded this way in the King James, but 2 Timothy 2.15 in the King James Version mentions rightly dividing God's Word. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
is the way it says. Now, the Greek word there actually means to cut straight. To cut straight. So not necessarily dividing. In fact, the cut straight part actually is a reference to road building. So if you're going to cut a path for a road, you want it to go straight. I mean, we don't make zigzag roads for fun. I mean, we follow contours of land and stuff like that when we need to, but you want a straight path as much as possible. To cut straight. In fact, all of the other translations that, that I have talk about or have it translated differently, they say, correctly handles the word of truth. It's a, it's a metaphor. It's, it's, an exp, it's a, just a way of speaking. So the Bible's not about dividing it up. When we divide it up, it breaks apart. That's not the idea here. The Bible is a whole, not random parts. And that's the point I want to drive home today. The Bible is a whole. It's not just a bunch of parts. It's a forest. It's not just a bunch of individual trees. So, let's see. I need a volunteer who uh, can pick out a random Bible verse for me. Anybody? What's that? Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13. Could you come up here? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Philippians 4.13. Okay, that's a good verse. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Good. Come on up. Come on up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Okay, we'll come back to that. Now, close your eyes. I'm going to give you the Bible. Open it up. Just open it up. Now, okay, I'll hold the Bible. Now, point to a spot on the page. Yes. Read what it says. Uh, Oh, the uproar of peoples, they roar like the roaring of great waters. Okay. And what does that say to you today, Holly? (laughs) Put me on the spot. I know. (laughs) Does, uh, does, does Does that speak to you today? It could? Yeah. You want to try again? Sure. Okay. Okay. Going for the New Testament. I see how it is. (laughs) Okay. Close your eyes. Yes. Oh, that's a big one. No. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Okay. That is from the prodigal son passage. So are you no longer worthy to be called, called, uh, called somebody's son? Well, you're not even not a, a son, son to begin with. <laughs> that doesn't really work for you very well, does it? No, I guess, yeah, unless you were repentant or something like that. Okay, one more time. Let's, let's see if we can find something that, that really works here. Yeah, you're trying to find Philippians. We'll come back to that. Okay. Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Okay. Um, how does that apply to your life today? Not, 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 not so much, does it? Okay. When, 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 don't go anywhere. You're up here with me, so you're okay. You're not up here by yourself. People are looking at me, not you. <laughs> Anyways, um, when you just pull out random verses like that, it doesn't 
there's, there's not really a lot of useful stuff that comes out of there because verses just by themselves, they don't stand up so well. Once in a while, though, you can find a verse that does stand up pretty well, even in light of the whole Bible. So, what was your verse again? Philippians 4.13. Okay. Why don't you read that? I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Okay. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, that, could, that can kind of stand on its own a little bit. But, let's say, let's say that you wanted to do something that wasn't right. Now, now does it work? No, not really. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. What if you wanted to be Superman? Or Supergirl? Yeah, well, let's say you wanted to be that. Would this verse apply to you? Well, yeah, if I read it out of context. Oh, 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 okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Out of context. So this doesn't apply to just anything, does it? No. What is it? It applies to only certain things. If you read the couple verses before that, just, 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 yeah, if you can. You can read it to yourself or to everyone, either way. Um, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Okay, now we've got some context. It's not about being, doing whatever you want. It's about, it's about being content in any and every situation, even if you're starving. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You've been a good sport. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can't read verses in isolation from each other. And when we do, we can get ourselves in trouble. Because if we could just do everything through him who gives me strength, and if that was all that it said, we could easily think, wow, well, then that means that if I just want it, that we could do anything. If God is going to be with me, then I can do anything I want. We might be kind of disappointed if what we want isn't what God wants. But... The point, of, the point of the matter is, we can, we can pick out random verses, but all verses belong to a bigger part. All verses belong to a chapter, a book, and each book belongs to the whole Bible. Okay. When you make a dish, a lot of you who are cooks out there, who, who cooks? Okay. So, all of you who... who cook things, when you put a recipe together or just what, whatever it is, let's say you're making a dish of some kind, uh, let's say you took all of those ingredients and instead of mixing them together and baking them or cooking them, let's say you just ate them one by one. How disgusting would that be? Or... And in some cases, you wouldn't be able to eat it at all. I mean, can you, have you tried to eat crunchy noodles before? That doesn't work very well, does it? You have, to, you have to put everything together. There's a reason why food goes together. There's a reason why the Bible goes together. If you try to just eat it one piece at a time all by itself, without thinking of the rest, it's not going to work so well. So here's just some things for it. The Bible has many writers, but one author. There's a lot of different people who wrote down the stuff on paper, but the Bible has one author. As many writers, but one author. And we can't just use them in isolation because while there are many writers there's one author 
And people can know Bible verses, but not the Bible. You can take all kinds of Bible verses, and you can take the Bible, actually, and make it say whatever you want. People do it all the time. If you've met a Jehovah's Witness, you know of some people who know a lot of Bible verses, but they don't know what the Bible says. The Bible can only be understood as a whole. The Bible has to be known as a whole. It can't be just its parts. Think, if, you, if you've ever read the, the book of Ecclesiastes, for example, if that was the whole Bible, that'd be pretty depressing. The very first verse, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's the whole verse. That's easy to take out of context. Or what if the whole Bible was the Song of Songs? If you've ever read through that, not, not very teachable for a Sunday school class very easily. Or if the whole Bible was just Esther, which is a good book, but God is never mentioned in Esther. Nowhere in Esther will you find the word God, Lord, or Jesus, or Christ, or anything like that. You need the rest of the Bible. And here's kind of the key. The whole Bible fits together in Christ, in Jesus Christ, who He is. That's what brings everything together. The person, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, the Bible talks about a person. Now, there are some people who like to split up the Bible into Jews and Gentiles, Old and New Testament. There are people who read the Bible and say, well, that was just for the Jews. This is for the Gentiles. Really, we can't do that very easily. In Christ, it says in the Bible, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly calls everyone who calls on him. And the whole book of Galatians, really, but here's, there's just one part, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Everything promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is ours in Christ. So if you belong to Christ, then all of these Old Testament promises, they're for you too. So we can't really just say, well, that was just for the Jews. In Christ, there is no Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I have a couple other verses here, but we'll move on here. Both Testaments, if, if... for, for the times that we might want to divide the Old and New Testaments up. Both Testaments testify to the same Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible is about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. And we can know that person. And so, when you're discussing the Bible and somebody throws out some obscure Old Testament text that you can't wear clothing with two different kinds of fabric, you know, something like that, don't say, well, that was just the Old Testament. Because that's not really an argument. There's no such thing as that was the Old Testament. We can't really make that argument. Because as silly as a command like that sounds to us today, there was a reason for that commandment. And that commandment itself may not apply to us today the same way, but that doesn't mean it's invalid. It doesn't mean we should cross it out of our Bibles. There's something behind it. And whatever it was, it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is everything the Old Testament ever talked about. If you open the Old Testament... And there's all these weird laws, there's all these strange stories, and you think, this is just kind of weird stuff. 
really, all of it is talking about Jesus Christ. I did a sermon series once in the evening called You Didn't Hear This One in Sunday School, and I picked all of the, the nastiest, most unpleasant Bible stories of the Old Testament and preached on those because, for, at least for me, I was like, okay, where is Christ here? You don't hear these, these stories in Sunday school. I stumbled upon them when I decided I was going to read the Bible from cover to cover. And it's like, holy cow. The Bible is not very kid-friendly in some parts. But as I studied for those, there was Christ there in all kinds of ways that I didn't even, under, I didn't even anticipate. So the New Testament doesn't trump the old, it fulfills or explains the old. It fulfills it. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. Those are still there. Those are still valid. I came to fulfill them or explain them. However you want to however you want to think of it. So if you're some of you are builders, when you build a house, or a barn, or any sort of structure, you need a foundation, right? And then you want a roof of some kind, right? But you can't have a roof without some sort of walls or something to hold it up, right? But at the very beginning, you need a foundation. You you lay the foundation first every time. Is that fair to say? I'm not a builder. I don't really know. But do you lay the foundation every time first? Yes? No? Yeah, okay. All right. Somebody who knows what they're talking about. Okay, good. That's helpful. Okay, you lay the foundation first. The Old Testament is the foundation. The New Testament is the house. If you don't have the foundation, you're not going to have much of a house. You have to lay the foundation first. The New Testament doesn't make sense without the Old. One other thing that we tend to gravitate to a little bit in the Bible is the words that are in red. What are, what, what, what are the red letters? If you have a red letter Bible, what, what, what makes the letters red? Anybody? Jesus' words, right. Okay. The red words are not the most important words. The red words are not the most important words. First of all, the Greek does not have red ink. If you look at the original text, Jesus' words are not in red there. Another problem is that in Greek, there are no such thing as an end quote. You can tell where a quote starts, But there's no such thing as an end quote. So there's parts of the Bible that we don't know if Jesus said that or if that's the narrator. One example, John 3.16. Jesus is starting to talk to Nicodemus. And we know that he started talking, but we don't know if John 3.16 is the narrator jumping in and explaining things. Jesus could have said it, or the narrator could have said it. We don't know, based on the text itself. In most red-letter Bibles, I believe it'll be in red. But in the Greek, we don't know. He might have said that. It might have been John writing that. Now, red-letter Bibles are not bad. I'm not telling you that you need to get rid of your red-letter Bibles. Don't misunderstand me here. Just recognize that the red letters don't trump everything else. The Bible is about the person of Jesus, but if Jesus' own words settled everything, then there wouldn't need to be a rest of the New Testament. If If there weren't anything else to say, then we wouldn't need a New Testament. But we need a New Testament because Jesus often spoke in in riddles and he didn't talk about absolutely everything. 
A lot of what he said had to be explained. Look at the screen here with me and answer the question. How do you come to know this salvation that the Bible talks about? The Holy Gospel tells me God himself began to reveal the Gospel already in paradise. Later, he proclaimed it by the holy patriarchs and prophets and portrayed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he fulfilled it through his own dear son. In other words, the whole message of salvation needs the Old Testament. Even at the very beginning, the gospel was starting to be proclaimed. When God said to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head. You will strike at his heel. That was the first mention of God's salvation. So, one last thing for you. The Bible is a single book about one God, one Savior, one faith, one salvation. We can't divide it up and say, well, that was for them, or this is, this is for just now. It all goes together. And it all points to a person. And it all explains a person. So when you read your Bible and you want to you put a verse on Facebook or you want to put a verse on your wall, that's, that's fine. But when you read it, make sure that you read it knowing what the rest of the Bible says. Because it's one God, one Savior, one faith, one salvation. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, we pray that we would not use uh, the Bible just randomly or in ways that are just convenient for us. Help us to know you as you truly are, to devour your word. And so that not that we can put forth our, our own ambitions, but Lord, so that we can better know who you are and what you want for us. And Lord, so that we can live the lives that you call us to live. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.